So welcome, first of all, to tonight's lecture on uh, chess endings. Uh, I had a, a, a game in particular that I wanted to show you, and rather than just going through uh, the whole ending, which is a very, very complicated one, I'll uh, embellish it with a few uh, notes and explanations uh, going from the game. First of all, I was in Vaikanze, Holland, Vaikanze. Vaik means village uh, by the sea, Vaikanze. Vaikanze was having, I think it's the 77th edition of the Vaikanze Chess Festival. And it's obviously been going on very, very long. I think it's the second longest running event beside Hastings in England, uh, which I think has gone beyond 100 years already, uh, their event. So in Vaikanze, uh, the top, top chess stars were there, Magnus Carlsen and some of the world's very best players, and our own American, now American, Wesley So. And Wesley was really, really impressive. He was doing tremendously well in the event. And in fact, he had only one blemish, only uh, one loss on his record, and that was against Anish Giri. I noticed that... Uh, Recently, in a Grand Prix event, Anish Giri uh, became the eighth player, uh, only the eighth player ever to cross the 2800 barrier, uh, and Anish is 2800. Very, very, very impressive. In this game, Anish Giri was white, uh, Wesley So is black, and as I mentioned, it was a game, it was the only game that uh, Wesley lost in the event. And Anish, uh, basically he's a player who likes the Catalan very much. And uh, he plays it with various systems, c4 or uh, d4 and knight f3. But he likes the Catalan and Wesley was all ready for it. And I think uh, here we see a very ambitious move by Wesley. Perhaps it was uh, due to the fact that he was actually scoring so well in the tournament. Uh, the most common move, of course, is bishop e7. And then we would get uh, a proper Catalan after this move order. And uh, Vladimir Kramnik, um, Livon Aronian, uh, or two of the most uh, prominent experts in the Catalan, but uh, certainly Anish is deserving uh, as well, as he plays it very well. For those reasons, uh, Wesley advanced his pawn d5, d4. This is a very ambitious move. Okay, it stops white from playing d4, but it's a very big tempo uh, to begin with, and then the question is whether or not the pawn is going to be uh, a target for white's pieces. First place, uh, Wesley defends the pawn. So we could get, after, for example, a move like b2, b4, uh, a Benko gambit, uh, reverse colors, and white's playing the black side of a Benko gambit. But e2, e3 is a very sensible move, and now we have a Benoni position, a reverse Benoni, and as you heard Mike, he was talking about the restrictive bishop. <laughs> you want to get your bishop out before you get trapped behind your own pawns? Well, there you have it. So d3, bishop d6. I thought, again, that this was uh, far too ambitious by black. I actually preferred that Wesley would have played, just a second, bishop e7. There are some very concrete reasons why the bishop on d6 is actually more of a target, uh, a tactical target, than on e7. Uh, bishop d6 was played, knight a3, e7, e6, e5, and this is one of those reasons. Uh, uh, c4, c5, and uh, white is trying to play knight c4, and get uh, to trade his c pawn for black's e pawn. Takes knight, knight d7. This was an error, in my opinion, 
uh, at this moment. Knight d7 I didn't like at all. And I preferred, I think it was the move bishop g4. Just a second here. Let me see if I wrote that down. I believe I did. Yeah, this was my... I was thinking that black might be able to escape with a b approximate equality after a line like this. Uh, I still have a slight preference for white, but I think that that would have been uh, a better choice than what Wesley played in the game. What Wesley played in the game was knight d7, and he got a position where it was four bishops, but white... Uh, uh, first of all, White's bishop on g2 is really excellent. It's really putting some nasty pressure. Uh, the rook along the fifth rank is also very active. And this pawn is actually in the way. If it wasn't on the board at the moment, you know, uh, there'd be ideas of bishop takes uh, f2 check and queen f6 check or queen d4 check. But the pawn on d4 is a liability. Queen b6 was played. And I thought this was an excellent move by Anish. A4. Okay, so just ideas of A5, A6, uh, taking advantage of this long diagonal as previously mentioned. Uh, black has a very, very uncomfortable position. A5 was played, Queen C2, Bishop B4, Rook B5, Queen E6, Bishop F4, and black just as getting more and more tied up. White wants to just simply develop his rook. Uh, there, are, there are moments that bishop d5 is a very nice tempo. The rook could swing back to e5, and again, rook c1, trying to come down with the queen to c7. All very good. Wesley decided it was time to jettison a pawn, play bishop d7, and the pawn was captured. So Wesley, in very big trouble here, and frankly, I thought he was losing. Okay. And it was remarkable uh, the fight that he put up. That is to say, Wesley resisted incredibly well at this point. Uh, Anish helped him a little bit with the move queen d1, which I didn't understand. I thought Anish would play queen e2, which I thought was a very strong move, uh, just to pre uh, prevent the bishop from coming to e6 without compromising the pawns. And if black plays rook e8, queen h5 is a very nice move indeed. Queen's active, your pawn up, everything's going in white's favor. So queen e2, bishop e6, rook, and we got a lot of trades. And we got to this position. This is probably the worst position that black, uh, that white could have achieved from the extra pawn, okay? He had this nice extra pawn with very good bishops. He traded off all of his bishops to get into a major piece ending. And here I thought Wesley suddenly and unexpectedly really had very good chances. Whenever you get into a major piece ending, uh, with queens and rooks, or simply queens, uh, the rule of thumb, besides who's ahead in material, who's up upon, who's down upon, it's really about king position. King position is crucial in queen endings as well as major piece endings with queen and rooks on the board. And thanks to this uh, pawn on g3, um, Black has a very concrete and direct idea, uh, as does White. Uh, Anish played b4 with the idea that he's forcing the creation of a passer on the queen side. And Black certainly does not want to allow the move b4, b5. But it, it was exactly here, exactly at this moment, that Wesley made a huge mistake, and had he played it in, a, in the proper way, I think he would have actually made a draw here. 
What do you think, uh, let me take away the notation for a moment. Probably you've all read the notation, so that was very clever of me. Uh, what do you think what black should do? What should black do to rescue his situation? shot out at once. Uh, one move that you may find attractive is, for example, queen f3. Rook takes d4, rook e2, which would be superb, except for the fact that you have a back-ranked mate. So first you have to deal with the back-ranked mate, as well as trying to create your own threats. And for that reason, the best move in the position was h5 which is a very, very, very strong move. After h5, Anish would have had a real, real problem uh, trying to um, rope in the wind, so to speak. Uh, for example, if he were to take the pawn, h4. Ooh. And um, suddenly this threat of h3 and queen g2 is really serious. If you take this pawn on h4, black has a, it, sorry, sorry. Uh, if you take this pawn on h4, uh, exposing uh, the white king, black has a very direct frontal attack with rook e6. Just a second rook e6, and then you're threatening rook g6 check, queen h1 check ideas, and suddenly these extra pawns on the a file and the h file are meaningless as white's king is in sudden danger. So this idea of king safety is so very vital. h4, rook back, h3, f4 is the best I could figure out for white. White protects the g2 square. Black threatens rook e2 with this move, queen f3. White has to stop that move. And now simply back with queen c6. And again, if you look at this position as opposed to what happened in the game, you'll really see that black has nice counterplay against white's queen. It's also kind of funny, the extra pawn here, if, if this a pawn was, were missing, uh, white would have ideas of rook e1 and a6 and a7 and you know, supporting the pawn. But in fact, these extra pawn isn't uh, very good uh, for white in terms of being able to push his pawn. I actually think that Wesley would have drawn the game rather comfortably had he played h5. Instead, he took. Now he played h5, and the timing is all wrong. Rook e4 ends uh, uh, black's threats. So now we get into the proverbial queen and pawn ending. Queen and pawn end games are terrible. They're really, really awful. Um, the, a lot of uh, uh, generalities, general rules, they just really go out the window. And in a lot of queen and pawn endgames, it's just about concrete calculation. You've got to calculate really long lines. And many, many lines, you have to be familiar with perpetual check patterns. Uh, and again, uh, it comes down to king safety. Pardon me, I think there was one thing I skipped here. Just a second. Hold on, let me, let me. There was a, a what, uh, yeah, um, Anish missed a very clear win, I thought. Just a moment, yes. So here, h5, this was the move I, so after rook takes d3, 
um, the rooks were traded, okay? So we get to this position, and again, in major peace endings, major peace endings, the whole mm, concept is king safety. Along with the concept of king safety is the idea of which player has the initiative, which player can uh, better attack the opponent's king. Well, in this exact position, it's white who has the attacking potential because we can see that he could go check, king here, check. Once white's king, what, pardon me, once white's queen is on this diagonal, his king is in perfect safety and black's king is not. So this was an amazing error by Anish Giri, in my view. I just did not expect that move at all. The move I had expected instead was check, going on the offensive. King would have to come to h7, queen goes to e4, check. Now, uh, this is a very, very common type of pattern that when you get into such situation, you want to go queen e5 and rook h8, check, and mate. The problem with queen e5 is Again, the king's safety issue, you don't want to allow queen f3. But what you just do is you advance the pawn, a6. The best I could find for Wesley was to retreat the rook and to bring back the king. And we get this rook ending. Okay. So now, in this rook ending, it's a... Oops, let me just do this. I beg your pardon. This is a very, very important position for rook endings. This ending is this position very important. What black wants to do is simply put his rook behind the pawn, and then it's, not, it's going to be impossible for white to um, promote his pawn to a queen without bringing his king all the way to b7. Yeah? Once you get the rook behind the pawn, the king has to go all the way over here. While the king is making its march all the way to b7 so that you can make a queen, I can gobble black's pawns on the king's side. Yes? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Rook f8. This is like a very, very key moment. And you mustn't miss it. A7 would be a terrible move because the rook would drop immediately back. But rook f8 not only attacks the pawn with uh, picking up a tempo with check, but it's also threatening to play a7 followed by queen. The only move for black is to play rook back to d7, stopping both threats. Now, for example, you play rook b8. Now, in this example, the black rook is not coming behind the pawn, you see. He has to play king g7. Rook, sorry, the white rook is not stuck in front of the pawn. Rook to b7, rook, pawn, rook. And now, the white king can just come all the way across, and you won't have time to eat any of the pawns. So king f3, and this is a winning position, an easily winning position for white. These rook endings are very, very tricky. But here, the important thing, whenever you get into a major piece endgame, and you're wondering, should I trade rooks or should I trade queens, one of the first and most vital questions you have to ask is whose king is in greater danger, okay? Who, who, if black's king is in danger, don't trade rooks. Don't trade queens, because maybe you could get a checkmating attack. Uh, what has happened was that instead we got to this queen ending. And again, queen endings are terrible. Uh, they're, they're really, really the worst types of endings to try to understand or to try to uh, 
study or make heads or tails of. I remember, how many of you read Alekhine's uh, two-volume series, Alekhine's Best Games? Don't all have, uh, you guys, you know, oh, what you've got to look forward to. It's wonderful, wonderful uh, chess writing. So Alekhine got himself into a position where he was a pawn down in the queen ending, and he sacrificed one, first one pawn, sacrificed the second uh, pawn, so he's three pawns down in the queen ending. But he had a pass pawn. So Alekhine said that when he was one pawn down, he was sure he was losing. When he was two pawns down, he was pretty sure uh, that he had drawn chances. And that when he was the third pawn down, then he knew it was a draw. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm trying to learn and understand a chess, and here's a former world champion explaining why it was better to be down three pawns than one. Because his pass pawn forced his opponent to give him a perpetual check. His pawn was huge in the position. This position is an incredibly easy win for white. Incredibly easy. All you have to do is go queen to b7, a5, a6, a7, queen. With the queen on the light square, your king is untouchable. It's, you, can't, you can't check, you can't do nothing. So it's game over. So the only thing that Wesley could possibly do is to open up White's king, to give himself more opportunities to get a perpetual check. And so he had to really gamble and he played the move g5. Okay. So white checked, checked, and offered the trade of queens. Can't trade queens because this pass pawn will just win the game. So Wesley had to s Wesley set up a cute little trick. He's hoping that white will push the pawn so he could go double check with a double attack. Takes check, queen f3. Now he has to take the pawn. Okay. On the surface, it might seem that black's operation didn't help, didn't help his cause. Uh, white's queen is beautifully on this diagonal, but for the moment, black has an opportunity of playing h4, which he didn't have when his pawn was on g7. So actually, black has improved his drawn chances have, after he's mangled his own pawn structure, because it's all about king safety. So here I thought Wesley uh, had chances of saving the game. Check here. Check, just a second, oh, sorry, it wasn't check. Um, let me turn the notation back on here. Okay, so we have a long series. At this point, again, it looks very simple from White's perspective. He just wants to go a5, a6, queen back to b7, a7, queen, and his king is in perfect safety. How can black possibly stop White from carrying out his plan? And then, do you know? Sir, H, H4. your only chance is to play h4 and h takes g3. So the idea of white's last move, queen a8, was first of all to be able to advance his pawn and then to meet h4 with queen h8 check. So he has to stop black from playing h4, as well as promote his own pawn. So king came back to g7, and here, again, it was kind of a, um, I don't know if this is really so much fun uh, for either the spectators or the players, but there's a modern day time control. The modern day time controls go something like this. You get two hours for your first 40 moves or so, or 90 minutes for your first 40 moves. But every time you make a move, you get a 30-second bonus. So sometimes when you're short on time, it, the, the players like to repeat a few moves so that they can gain a couple of minutes on their clocks.
So for the next few moves, what we were seeing was that the players were simply uh, marking time so that they could gain time on their clocks. And we've got, uh, uh, nothing really has changed so much over these last few moves. Okay, so now we come to a very key moment in the game. And uh, I think that at this moment, White Anish missed his clearest and most uh, concrete path to victory. He has played in the game Queen E4, which again is this kind of moves that gain uh, time on the clock. Instead, he should have played the simple Queen B5, okay, offering the trade of queens. Queen G4. Now it's a fight over who gets this diagonal, long diagonal. White gives a check, black moves a king, and finally you push the pawn. And again, it's just a home run. It's a touchdown. This guy's just going to go to coordination. You only have one chance, and that is h4. You've got to break up the safety of, of white's king. a6, away we go, takes. Now, on the surface, it appears both sides have uh, gotten through their respective plans. On the one hand, white is uh, making a queen. On the other hand, black is doing his best to expose white's king. But here's a key moment, queen f3. I also believe that a7 is winning, but after takes, king takes, there's going to be a lot of checks. <laughs> You've got to run all the way out the board uh, close to your queen to escape the checks. But this one is a very nice move. Queen f3, and just a second, queen f3. So the idea here is that you're going to use your f pawn as a form of protection for your uh, king. So for example, if we play, let me just move my queen all the way over to a4, queen takes g3 check. Ooh. Yeah, ooh, uh, king has to go. Where would we like to go with our king? Uh, f7. F7. So let's go over here with our queen. Check. Check. Plus. Plus. So if we go back with king g6, I go Push. a7. Push. If we go check with our queen, that's a oopsie daisy. We get to trade <laughs> queens. Oopsie daisy. If we go check here, I'm using my f pawn so that there's no check here. So once again, We'll go queen check, king here. And you can't go queen here because of the so same reason. Oopsie daisy. oopsie daisy. So you have to go back. Again. New variation. And once again, uh, we've got uh, our king beautifully protected. That variation, remarkably enough, was not played, and the game went longer and longer and longer. Now, Anish Giri, of course, representing Holland, and in Vaikanze, there was a huge audience. The game, it, it, it got bigger and bigger because Anish was winning this crucial game uh, for, you know, tournament victory. So we, I was doing this show on the air, and we couldn't go off the air. We were like, hey, sorry, well, that's the end of the show. We'll tune in tomorrow to find out who won. So five hours became six hours, which became seven hours, and so forth and so on. And uh, it was very strange. We had these webcams. So we had this beautiful webcam photo, high definition webcam photo. And on one side, there's Wesley. On the other side, there's Anish. But the camera and wonderful audience shots. As everybody was, you know, you could see everybody pointing and talking with amongst themselves. But just a little bit in the background with two other players from the challenger section also still playing. Whoa, what was that? You know, like late at night, everybody, you know, everybody's 
gone home, you know, and these two other players are playing. And I was struggling with this queen ending, trying to explain what was going on. And I said, okay, well, let's, out of respect, go and see what they were doing in their game. So I go on the computer and I go to the challenger section and I pull up their game. Guess what? A queen ending. <laughs> I'm like, ah, okay, show's over, everybody. No, no more queen endings. Well, let's see what, uh, how um, Wesley was able to put up such resistance. So there we have what looks like a beautiful position for white. Uh, he's stopping h4, he's on the diagonal, he's done everything right, but at the moment he's not advanced the pawn. So uh, black just says, okay, I'll wait. I'll wait for you to do something. And now we have queen b5, queen g4, and we get this position. Okay. A5. Okay, so now uh, Anish is back on track. He's back to winning. H4. Uh, remember those lines with queen takes uh, queen f3. Now it's very, very different. What happened was we get to this position, this position, and uh, a crucial moment right here. Queen b6. Okay. So Anish has a very easy winning move. All he has to do is play the move king to g1. So what's the difference? Remember a moment ago when I was talking about yeah, how the f2 pawn is a, a really nice shield uh, for white's king. Let's say we go here. Let's say we go here. We're, we're, we're very happy. We're ready to advance our pawn. Again, if we go back to stop it, check. And again, white's got the ideal setup. He's on the long diagonal. There'll be no perpetual check. Instead, Anish had an oversight. He missed that after queen b6, king g2. What move can black play? Then there. Queen c6 check would be king g1, and we're back into that winning situation. H3. H3 check. A great, great resource suddenly. And here is the crucial difference. That the pawn on g3 is not a, as good a defender, is, is, is not a good protection as the pawn on f2. Very, very often in queen endings, it's much better to have the pawns that are defending your king back on the second or seventh rank as opposed to forwards. If we look at this position, we can see that there are more check possibilities for black now. Like one of the most standard uh, um, uh, perpetual check mechanisms, forgetting that the queen defends g4, is for black to be able to play queen h1, check, king g4, queen e4, check, and just keep repeating the checks as often uh, as necessary. Mm -hmm. So there's already one uh, perpetual uh, check mechanism in the position, and Anish now has a very hard slog ahead of him. And here we go. Uh, we're seeing, again, that white's king is um, uh, vulnerable to uh, different perpetual checks. This was another extraordinary moment in this ending. And again, these players are world, world-class players, so do not feel bad if you don't understand queen and pawn endings, because they, they made a, 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 quite a number of errors. Just a moment ago, you, were, you heard me explain that the pawn on f2 is much better protection for the, t for the king than the pawn on g3. The same holds true for black, that this pawn on f6 helps protect his king a lot more from checks. And I was really shocked when Wesley played this move f5, which I considered 
an extremely bad move, like extremely bad move. So queen g2, offering a trade of queens. Uh, queen uh, uh, a1, and now we see check. Now uh, black's king is actually has to go up. If black's king goes backwards, then comes queen check, a7. Yes, and you just queen. So king g5, king's more exposed up here. And now uh, uh, Wesley's queen is in some ways kind of ideal. Uh, in chess, at the chessboard, there's a kind of a strange geometry at times. And this is, a, this is an, uh, an ideal example of a strange geometry. The queen is actually in a perfect position. On the one hand, it's in this corner, so it's defending, it's behind the pawn. On the other hand, it's looking at this corner for an idea of checking, as well as h8. So it's like a perfect billiard, you know, like in uh, three different directions that uh, uh, white, uh, black wants to harass That's white's king. Yeah, it's kind of triangles and stuff. Okay, so now white decides that uh, if he just tries to go queen b7 and to advance his pawns, well, there are checks coming and there's just a repetition. So what white decides he's going to do is take his king and move it all the way over to b7 so that he can win the game by pushing his pawn. And so we have, again, a lot of checks going on, a lot of checks, and every time uh, Anish is ready to move his king over to the queen side, black has done something to block white's advance. Now, at this point, something strange happened here with the king on f3, queen so it looks very similar to a position we had a moment ago where the queens were all in the corners here. But something very strange happened that this occurred. White was able to make a series of checks where he managed to bring his queen all the way back to the center and advance his pawn at the same time. So, but this was only possible because there was a pawn, if this pawn was on f6, this would not have been a check, of course, and black's king would have been in greater safety. Because the king was exposed, white had this very nice maneuver, which Anish executed very well. He got this position and he was able to advance his pawn to a7. One of the key, yeah, one of the key ways when you're a pawn ahead in a, in a queen and pawn endgame to win the ending is to have a centralized queen. It's just as, as a general rule, it's, it's incredibly important to put your queen in the center when you're trying to win. As we see in this case, the defender's queen was trying to check in the corner and do all of as many checks as he possibly could. So there was a whole lot of more checks and a lot of checks. And eventually, uh, black has uh, run out of checks. Queen a3. One of the best winning mechanisms when you're trying to win is to force your opponent, the defender's queen, in front of the pawn, okay? When the, def like, rooks belong behind pass pawn, well, so do queens. So the queen on a3, what Anish is trying to do is force his opponent's queen into a passive blockading position, which reduces his opportunities to give perpetual check. And this is uh, where the game ended. <laughs> One extra queen. So this, 
So this, and this ending uh, was a, a, a very, very important ending, not only for the final standings in the tournament. I believe at the end of the tournament, Anish Giri and Wesley So were two of three players who tied for second, along with the Frenchman MDL, Maxime Vachar Le Grave. And had Wesley drawn this game, he would have been clear second. Had he won it, he would have tied for first. So it was a very big, big turn of events. And uh, this ending has a lot of lessons, uh, but it's like one of those endings where, you know, experience, you know, really counts a lot. So I'm sitting there on the sidelines and the computer engines are whizzing and everybody's twittering and saying, could he have drawn and stuff like this. And uh, I was watching as a number of errors were being played by world-class players. One of the reasons that happened is if you go back to, let's say, the 70s and, and earlier, the grandmasters of those ages, uh, Capablanca, Alakai, Badvinik, Petrosian, they would adjourn. They would adjourn the game. And the game would be stopped for hours, sometimes days. Teams of anal analysts and trainers would work on the position, and then the grandmasters would show extraordinary technique, and they would win almost perfectly uh, the, the game. The, in modern chess, the players have to play to a finish. There's no adjournments. They don't have the time to calculate everything and to be uh, precise and perfect with their play. No, they have to just play and uh, that, th th that they're forced at times to make errors. Uh, how many of you actually have played queen endings? I played a number myself, not too many. A queen ending I played was uh, the, it was described as the game that uh, that couldn't devour China. <laughs> the game that couldn't devour China. Okay, how did it go? I was in the Chess Olympiad in, two, in 1988 in Thessaloniki in Greece. And I was playing, of course, for the United States team, and I was playing against uh, China. And uh, I had an adjourned game of queen pawn. I had a queen and five pawns against my opponent's queen and four pawns. And we played for, 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 for many hours, and we adjourned again. And in the next adjournment, I had queen and four pawns <laughs> against queen and three pawns. Then we adjourned again. And this continued literally until I had queen and, you know, each, each session we would trade a pair of pawns and the game went way beyond 200 moves, way beyond 200 moves, and well beyond like five, six days. <laughs> Messed up all of the whole Olympiad pairings and everything. And in uh, Seattle, in Washington, we have a magazine that goes for uh, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho State, Pacific Northwest Chess. So on the cover of the, the magazine was the start of the game, right? You open up the magazine, and on the top, all of the game, and, and it was in a, inside a dragon, by the way. So like there's the, the body of the dragon, and then there's this text. And throughout the whole issue, <laughs> you know, on, on every page, the dragon went to the end of the issue because it was this game, like my, maybe my longest game ever. And, and these queen endings are really, really hard. Uh, for those of you who raised your hand on the queen endings, did you struggle? Did you find them difficult to understand? Yes, no, it was, were they easy? Uh, but the queen endings uh, have their own set of rules. And it's sometimes I get bogged down. Uh, I think endings, learning endings are absolutely vital. But uh, queen endings are quite less frequent, I find, than rook endings or minor piece endings or king and pawn endings. So a lot of people don't study queen endings. Young man. 
the game ended in a draw. I couldn't devour China. <laughs> ah, the game ended in a draw. Oh boy, everybody was disappointed. About 15 years later, by the way, I was in Beijing and I went and I visited the Chinese Chess Association. And it's a beautiful building in Beijing. And the building, uh, which is devoted to two games, actually, chess and the game of Go, okay? It's both a dormitory, like many, many players from around China go to Beijing and they live at, at that building. They have dorm rooms and it has cafeterias, libraries, playing halls, you name it, it's there. And I have met Dr. Lin Feng, Lin Feng. So he was a very sweet man, uh, he was happy to see me, and we, 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 we chatted and so forth and so on. And he said to me, oh, by the way, I have a story to tell you that you don't know. And I go, yes, what is it? He said, in Thessaloniki in 1998, he was the captain of the men's Chinese team. I go, yes, 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 of course. And he said, you played against Zhu Jun. Uh, our player and I go yes is that the game that went for 250 moves he goes yes and for like five or six days in a row we had adjourned each day and the next day we have to play in the morning at nine so Lin Fei had gotten up every morning at night to go to the tournament hall and to be there and wait for the result and no result and he just came perpetually every day so much so that he had set his alarm clock and he had gone to the tournament hall and he had sat down in the tournament hall and fell asleep only to wake up and realize that the game had been finished the day before <laughs> that it wasn't necessary for him to get up so he said he, all, he had been carrying a grudge for 15 years <laughs> Uh, any questions about this uh, queen ending or uh, uh, any questions about uh, queen endings in particular? Young man. So let me just put one on the board for a second. I'm going to play poorly for both players. Okay. Variation, check. Again, I'm just going to play poorly for both players. So here is a uh, typical, so this is one perpetual checking pattern that is very typical, yeah? Now just imagine how good it would be to have our pawn on f2. Let's say you go, try to run away. Now you're hoping that I will check on e2 so that you could interpose your queen, yeah? But I don't want to do that. Check. I want to check you like this. Check. And I want to just keep you check. Check. in this very typical perpetual checking pattern, yeah? And this is just really based on a lot of experience, right? I mean, the more you play chess, you see these these perpetual uh, patterns and they repeat themselves constantly. Uh, you'll always see them. And I recall I had played one uh, queen ending where we had danced around and around and around and um, I had made a, a, a draw. I was trying to make the draw and I claimed the draw but the, the, the checks came in a sequence of like 21 consecutive checks where it was a three move repetition, right? That uh, we went round and round in circles. And I remember uh, uh, another queen ending I had against Michael Tall. And we had an adjournment and it, it was very exciting adjournment because the, I was uh, ahead in material, I was better. And it seemed like uh, there were 12 hands helping me, <laughs> you know, the, my, the whole American team <laughs> were all making moves showing me how I have to beat Michael Tall. And we did a, a, a run around the Rosies uh, there. It, it was a very funny um, uh, pattern 
that I ended up winning the game. I was, I was ahead of material in that game. But this awareness, you just have to have this awareness of your king safety. That is like a, a crucial, crucial element as well as the pass pawn. Other questions? It's all good, it's all good. Uh, the last thing I really did want to emphasize was this moment back here when they got into this queen and rook position. This queen and rook versus queen and rook position. Like white has, uh, let, let's, sorry, let's go back here to this moment. If we stop at this moment, white just has everything. He's got two great bishops, a very, very powerful rook. This pawn on d4 is weak. And it was just remarkable how um, Anish just went for a position of queen and rook versus queen and rook, where now his advantage is limited to a single pawn, and how in this position, recognizing that uh, it's really about king position, that uh, Wesley did not play the move h5. That was really shocking for me. And again, right here, uh, you could look at the games. You can go to uh, the, the Tata Steel chess website, and they'll have this game with comments by the players too, by the way, very nice. And uh, you can put this position in your chess engine, and you'll be shocked to realize that your chess engine starts to say that black is fine. That it's, you know, like that even though he will be down a pawn, uh, down two pawns, the chess engine says black is fine due to the threats to white's king. And that makes all the difference in the world. And then finally, just this position, oops, sorry, I don't want that position anymore. I want this position, this idea that right here. It's a critical moment in this trading rooks. Because queen endings are so notoriously drawn, this idea of trading rooks, I would have, I would have avoided it as much as possible and again ask myself that question, whose king is more vulnerable? And the moment you, pardon me, the moment you realize that, wait a minute, after check, white's king isn't vulnerable, no, White's king is actually, uh, actually doing wonderfully. Uh, let's play for the attack. Yeah. <coughs> attack. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the snow and ice. <laughs> I know I will. Thank you. Thank you.